Hey, how you doing? This is RJ. Today, I'm going to do something that I don't usually do. I'm going to do a review of a new book. And there's a reason why, and I'll get to the reason why at the end. But I'm going to review X-23 because I walked into my comic shop on Wednesday and I saw it and there was a big stack of them there, more than any other comic that was on the stands. And I picked it up and I kind of liked the art. So I'm going through it and... I just, I want to go through it for you people who haven't had a chance to get to your comic shop yet, and I'll give you a little review of it so that you know whether or not to pick this up yourself and under that huge stack that you'll probably have at your comic shop. Now, I'm going to go through it, and I'm going to give you a picture right off the bat here, and I'm pretty sure you can tell by my tone of voice what kind of review this is going to be, but I want to give you a picture right off the bat from about the middle way of the comic. I think it's, what page is it on? It's page like 16, I think. So there's something in here. These, these um, I don't know if it was the writer or the artist that actually put this in here, but in this picture here, I'm showing you. The thing is that these people who write and draw comics today, they think they're subtle. They think they're really smart. And they put in these little jokes here and there. Little nods to things. Little things that they want people to not see in the background, but to be there as a ha ha ha. Yeah, And, you know, artists have done that for a long time. But I think what I'm showing you here is going to give away a little bit of what is going on and what is this book's tone. So you have two students in the Xavier Institute here. This is from the middle of the book. And of course, all of the students, almost all of the students in the Xavier Institute that you're probably going to see in the background, none of them look human, even though, of course, most humans in all of Marvel's history, most, most mutants in all of Marvel's history looked human. There's only the odd one that doesn't look human. But here you have a bunch of them and none of them look human in the background anyways and one of them is carrying a book called nudism 101 and he actually looks like he's nude walking down the halls he just has the book covering certain parts of him of course and the other one has a book called william blake now for most people who don't know who William Blake is, and most people probably don't know who William Blake is, he was a poet slash painter who lived, let me see if memory serves, I think it was uh, somewhere around the mid-1700s to the late 1700s. And he was what they would call a unique artist. So what's a unique artist? Well, that's artistry talk for he was a crazy person. That's what it is. I mean, he's not crazy and he wasn't crazy enough so that they would put him in, a, in an asylum, but he was crazy enough so that if you went away for the weekend, you wouldn't leave your dog with him because you wouldn't know if your dog would be alive at the end of the weekend. That's the kind of crazy that he was. So he did all these poems and pictures where in order to actually explain what is going on within the pictures and the poems, he had to create his own entire mythology. And I think that's part of what they're trying to do with this book. They're trying to create their own separate mythology within the Marvel Universe with X-23. Because obviously the Wolverine thing didn't stick, so they're going to create their own mythology. Now, you can create your own mythology within the Marvel Universe, and that can be perfectly fine. But to do it separate in its own little crazy way... And yeah, that, that's not going to fly. So let's start from the very beginning of the book and we'll move on from there. Now, of course, the first page of the book is nothing but a black page with a lot of text on it. And this is, as many people have pointed out, just a wasted page. And if you look at it, because I'll give you a picture of it, it is a wasted page. You're, they're wasting your money right there. You're opening the book and on the first page they're wasting your money because one third of the page is taken up by X-23, which you kind of know that it's X-23. That's the name of the book on the cover. If you don't know that by now, put it down. The other third of the page is the credits 
and they have a lot of credits there. And I really don't need to know who the executive producer or the president is or even who they want to give special thanks to. I really don't need to know that. I don't even need to know who the chief creative officer is. No, thank you. I really don't. Um, and they can take all of this stuff and push it into a tiny little box at the bottom of the page like they used to under the first picture. And then in the middle, the other third of the page is taken up by a description of what the book is, a little bit of text. And to tell you right now, as someone who is coming into this story a little bit cold, it tells me nothing. It tells me absolutely nothing. It's useless text. It's useless. And even if it wasn't useless, if they wanted to do that, again, that could be put at the top of a page. I used to read Conan. Conan had this big old long explanation at the top of every first page. It was a lot longer than this, and they still stuck it on a page with good art. So this is a wasted page. And then you move on to the second page. Now, when you get to the second page, what happens on the second page? Well, you get a whole bunch of exposition. A whole bunch of exposition that actually explains the story a little better than that little blurb that was on the black page. So what is the reason for the black page to begin with? Well, if it looks like it has no reason, it must have some reason. And the reason, of course, is to inflate the egos of the people who are credit it on this page. That's pretty much it. That's all that uh, some of these pages are and some of these books are for these people in Marvel. It's just to inflate their ego, to say, hey, look, I, I worked on a Marvel book. That's pretty much what it is. That's what that page is. That's what it's telling me. And I know I'm starting to rant here and I'm thinking this whole thing is going to be a rant because this is just the beginning. So to move on to the actual story. So you got your little page of exp exposition, and it's not terrible, and it's not the best way to do it. You know, first-person writing, I like first-person writing. I think it's the best way to write myself, personally. Um, but you really, I think, need to flow a little better than it does here. The the um, the way that the sentences work with the art, and even within themselves, it doesn't flow very well. But we'll skip by that. You know, that's just a personal thing. And when you have the first splash page, it's actually pretty good. I, I Like I said, I like this art. Now, you're looking at the page with um, Gabby, and you're looking at the page with Laura and with Gabby, and... You know, it's not a bad page. It's got some good action in it. It starts the book off in a good action pace. That's great. They're looking kind of silly, if you ask me. They both look like they're wearing some sort of exercise outfits that the artist just opened up, I don't know, some kind of catalog and said, oh, I'll use that as my reference. And he tried to put in a couple of X's here and there to make it look like superhero uniforms, but they really don't. If anything, with the whole small glove stuff going on and everything else that's going on in this book, there's a couple of other places too. Um, I think this writer, I've heard this writer's name before and not in a good way. I really don't know much from this writer. I really don't even know if it's a male or a female. It's Mariko Tamaki. So I think this person, whoever they are, is probably a big anime fan. One of the reasons is these uniforms, especially the tiny little gloves, which makes no sense. Okay, so to move on from these silly little uniforms, because that's just a silly little thing. They do look a little bit ridiculous. If you ask me, there's plenty. They, they're trying to take, him, I think, her away from Wolverine because it didn't work. So trying to give her her own unique look. But honestly, they should do something like, uh, I think the best one that I've seen her in is the White Tiger one from Battleworld. That was good. And it, it actually gave some reference to older books, older Wolverine costumes that he wore like twice. That was it. Anyways, so to move on. So they're free falling out of a building and basically chasing after these guys who have rocket packs. So they have to free fall towards them. And the story is ruined almost right there to begin with. Why? Because you're free falling out of a building uh, and they start talking to each other. Yeah, that's what you do when you're free falling out of a building. Of course, when you're free falling out of a building, you know, you can perfectly hear the other person talking next to you. That That's just nature, right? You can do that. And uh, uh, you can have a conversation. See, again, this is the, the writer, whoever they are, I think being a closet anime fan or maybe even not a closet anime fan thinking that you know if you ever watch these anime where you are, have these two characters on a battlefield and they're ready to fight this other person and it's in the middle of a battle and all of a sudden they get in a conversation and of course nothing else happens they don't get hit they don't get shot then nothing else you know because they're having a conversation here so everything else stops automatically in the world right so that's what happens in these panels 
They're having a conversation as they fall, free fall, out of this skyscraper and attack these people. Which, again, makes no real sense. But hey, it makes sense to an anime watcher. That's all I can figure out what this writer is trying to do. There is a good page where they're coming near to the ground and uh, Laura actually flips around in order not to crash into the ground after the person that she's sort of flying down on this crashing rocket pack um, crashes himself into the ground. Uh, that was actually pretty good. I like the way the art works there and that worked really well. I thought, that's something. And then you move on to Gabby. And Gabby is being, as uh, Richard would say over at Diversity in Comics, he always says, she's being LOL so random with her humor. Yes, she is indeed. It's just strange humor, to say the least. Um, she is talking to Laura over some kind of intercom, describing the person who was attacking her, calling him the Band-Aid Man. Yes, yes, that's that's great humor there. But we'll move on from that. I want to get back to Gabby. We'll get back to Gabby at the end. I want to go through the book first, and then we'll get back to Gabby. So, Laura actually has a couple of good scenes again, and then she gets completely freaked out when Gabby is about to get crushed by a truck. So, I get back to Gabby, I said. Yes, get back to Gabby. Let's move on. So, after this scene, so let's see, how many pages is that now? We're talking 12 pages, so 11 of those were action, so not too bad, out of 32. But then, for the entire rest of the book, and this is the number one, by the way, for the entire rest of the book, all you have is people standing around, sitting around, talking. So, 32 pages, 11 at the first, and then talking, talking, talking. And only 10 of those 11, because you have the big idiotic splash page of nothing at the first, Ten of those pages are action. That's it. Starts off good, falls off really quickly. And you have Laura talking to Beast because Beast has some new information for her uh, about mutants and um, clones, right? Okay, here's what I don't understand. Clone stories are stupid. Nobody likes them. I don't like them. I mean, if they knew anything about Marvel history... Just all you got to do is go back to Spider-Man and, and the Clone Saga and realize that people get sick and tired of these things really quickly and it screws up your continuity. Don't do clone stories. You want to do something like this? Do a story where you have a long lost um, daughter or son. Yeah, I know the whole Laura thing's been done and they can't really change that and whatever else, but they don't need to focus on it. Why? Why would they focus on it? Nobody wants to read these stories anymore. Nobody wants to read clone stories. Clone stories are just ridiculous. And the long lost daughter thing or son thing, you know, I know it's a trope. It's it's a crutch that works for writers, but but it works. Whereas the clone thing, not so much. And why is Gabby doing this? Well, Gabby, I mean, uh, Laura, why is Laura doing this? She says, this is her job now. This is her job to track down all of these things and to stop this cloning. So she talks to Beast and she gets to tour around a little bit of the Xavier Institute and she gets to meet, oh, guess what? She gets to meet uh, another set of clones who are the clones from the White Queen. Uh, yeah. So not only do you have the clones, the two clones of Wolverine tracking down other clones, but then you have another set of clones all together just happenstance running into them at the Xavier Institute. So you got clones everywhere. Clones everywhere. Nobody wants clone stories. And one of the other ridiculous things, and I don't know if it's the art or artist or the writer in this, again, wherever they're going around the Xavier Institute, they see all of these pictures. You can see all these pictures on the wall. And what are these pictures from? Well, these pictures are covers of old X-Men. That's what they are, literally. If you uh, Maybe you might not know these things. I don't know how much of X-Men history you know, but they're literally pictures of covers of old X-Men. That's ridiculous. That's taking you out of the story right there. That's yanking you out of the story. Should not be there. Should not be there. Should not be there. So, again... The rest of the book is talking, talking, talking. And again, you get your LOL, so random humor with Gabby and talking to the other clones, and she's a clone. And the whole point of this is that it's their birthday or their chosen birthday, and Gabby wants to know when her birthday is, and she gets upset with Laura because Laura knows when her birthday is. And and um, then they have this 
seen in a diner. And they have this idiotic thing again where it has the Marvel logo right at the top because the uh, name of the place where they go to eat is called Marvel Falafel. And it has the actual Marvel logo. Again, ripping you out of the story right there. And I don't know, again, I don't know who Marika Tamaki is. I really don't. And let me just guess. Is she a girl? Because I don't even know male or female. I don't know. I can't tell from the name. Um, but honestly, I think she might be an overweight chick who sits around eating too much food with her friends and talking and talking and talking. And they ask each other, why is my life not going the way that I thought it would be? It doesn't seem to happen that way. What's going on? What's going on is you're sitting on your brains and shoving food into your face because there's a whole lot of food in this book. I don't get that. I, but anyway, so they're just sitting there eating at a diner, talking about birthdays. Yes, exciting number one. This is your exciting number one issue. Sitting at a diner, eating, talking about birthdays. And then they go home and talk some more. And then it moves on to the other clones who are in the story, the Emma Frost clones. And it gives a lot of story about them because it starts about, I think it's page 22. So we're talking the whole last one third of the book. And you get a little flip back and forth to Laura, but mostly it's about these other clones who are the villains in this book. Now, you want to set up the villain? Great. They don't need 10 pages, and they certainly don't need 10 pages of walking around, standing around, talking to each other. Have some action. Have some action. Something. So all they do is set up the fact that they have two extra clones who are dying and they need to somehow revive them. But one of the clones is looking to steal everybody else's power from the clones and she's going to attack the rest. And this is supposedly supposed to set up some kind of story for the next couple of issues. If it's anything like this one, it's going to be as boring as dirt. But hey, it flips back to Gabby again and Laura and Laura thinking about the fact that yes it's her birthday and she's going to have a new beginning so that's your end of number one so I wanted to go back and talk about Gabby for a bit because that's your that's the end of the book they she realizes it's her birthday and she's going to have a new start that's pretty much it so yeah standing around talking doing a whole lot of nothing but I wanted to go back to Gabby because Gabby is a little bit important in this book because, again, Richard over at Diversity in Comics is always saying this phrase. He says, SJWs don't human very well. And, oh, sweet merciful heavens, do they not? Oh, they do not even know what a human being actually acts like. Because here you have this book to get back to Gabby. So Gabby is, I'll say... A, Pretty sure from this book it says that she doesn't know how old she is. But you're looking at her physical structure. And she's a girl. I'd say 13 tops. But probably more like 10 or 11. All right? And then you listen to the way that she talks. Now, I've heard people say before that she talks this way because the writer doesn't know how to write. Okay, that's fair enough, possibly. The writer is thinking that... This little kid, that all little kids that are 10 or 11 or 12 talk like this. Yeah, there are some people out there that I suppose would think that. Um, they're not correct, but hey. But let's assume that she actually wrote her this way because she wanted her to actually talk this way. So the mental state of this kid, of Abby, although her body is, we'll say, 11... Her mental state is somewhere around six because that's the level of intelligence that she has. We'll say six to eight years old. That's the level of intelligence this person has. So fairly young. So we'll split the difference between what she looks like physically and what she acts like mentally. And we'll say she's about 10. All right. So you have this 10 year old and this drives me insane and i'm sure it drives other people insane as well because why because if you look at the old mutant books if you knew anything about x-men or any of the other books in the marvel continuity you would know that you don't take children into battle 
And that's what Laura is doing. She's taking this child, who she calls her sister, into battle with her to on her little personal quest to stop all of these clones from being created. If you go back to the New Mutants, they were students. They were given uniforms so that they could train and learn how to use their powers. They were given some little bit of self-defense courses in case the mansion was attacked. They were never sent on missions. They were never expected to fight. They were specifically barred from fighting. Whenever they would go and have a little adventure or be attacked or something unexpected would happen, they would get punished. Because they weren't supposed to go and do these things. And even if you look at the really old X-Men, because I have some really old X-Men, yeah, that's the way it was back then, too. They they were students, and they weren't supposed to be out there because there was never a battlefield back then. There was just, you know, random mutant here or there or something like that, a bank robber, whatever. The locust, you know, silly little villains like that. But they weren't supposed to attack anybody, and they weren't supposed to be soldiers in any way, shape, or form. They weren't supposed to go out and, and be soldiers. And that's certainly the way that uh, New Mutants was. And that was the newer book that talked specifically about mutants that were younger. And when they became X-Force, they specifically said to Professor X, you know, we are old enough now to make our own decisions. We're going our own way. But no, Gabby is about 10 years old and her sister is dragging her into battle. Now, what is right in this book? Right in this book, what is Laura's stated mission in this book? Why is she doing this? Why is she attacking these people at the first of the book? Well, she's attacking these people at the first of the book because they have stolen some DNA data from mutants. And the line here is, data that could be used to create more soldiers. But she says, that's not going to happen. And she's not going to let that happen. So, she's not going to let that happen. She won't let new mutant soldiers be created. But she has this 10-year-old girl next to her. And she turned her into a soldier. So, her stated mission is... She doesn't want new mutant soldiers being created. She's going to stop that at any cost. And what's the cost that she stops that at? She has a partner who is a mutant soldier child. Who she, who she creates and makes her into a soldier. She she buys her weapons. You know, she bought Gabby for this mission. She bought her, uh, I'll give you the picture. She bought her a pair of nunchucks and some brass knuckles. Because that's what every 10 year old needs, right? Some brass knuckles to go beat on people. She's turning her in. She turned her. I mean, Gabby already was trained to be a soldier. Yeah, sure. Fine. Trained to be a soldier. You know, plenty of kids, even in the Marvel Universe, even with the mutant universe, they were abused in some way, shape or form, but were made into people to go to school and taken out of that lifestyle. It wasn't, you know, ah, well, look, you were a soldier. Might as well be a soldier. It doesn't matter if you're 10. No. And this is one of the things that drives me nuts because I've seen it in movies and I've seen it in television a number of times over the last few years. But most people don't really get this and I don't know why they don't get it. But making a child soldier is one of the worst things that you can do. Making a child into a soldier is one of the worst things that you can do. Just look at it legally. It is one of, on the top tier of one of the worst war crimes that you could commit. Taking a child and making them into a soldier. It is right up there with genocide. Right? It's up there on the top level of the bad, of the bad, the worst of the worst things that you could do. Making a child into a soldier. And yet you have these books. And yet you have these shows. You have these movies. Where you have people taking children... And turning them into soldiers. Right here, Laura is taking Gabby and turning her into a soldier. Or at the very least, keeping her being a soldier. It makes no sense. And not only does it make no sense, but this is not a hero. This woman, who is the clone of Wolverine, she is not a hero. And everybody will say, well, look at Wolverine. He had Shadowcat. He had Jubilee. Again, 
Those two tagged along with him and weren't supposed to be there. He tried to get rid of them at every turn. And when he was able to get rid of them, he did. He didn't prop them up and say, hey, you're going to be my sidekick. And if you get killed, so what? No. Because he knew that as children, and they were a lot older than Gabby is, that they should not be following him around and being soldiers. That they should not do what he is doing. That they should not learn from him. Again, this drives me nuts. I don't know. Do people not know that making a child into a soldier is one of the worst crimes that you can commit? One of the worst war crimes that you could commit. Not just one of the worst crimes you commit. One of the worst war crimes that you can commit. This does not make Laura a hero. It makes her amoral, to say the least. And again, you want to go back to Gabby's, the way she talks, and her flippant attitude towards violence, getting pulverized and almost crushed, well, actually crushed one time in this book. She makes jokes. Guess what that makes her? Well, she's some kind of... I don't know if she's a psychopath or a sociopath or what, but she's certainly a very mentally unstable person, especially for a 10-year-old. Maybe you will want to take her out of that situation, especially if you have, I don't know, um, a special school for mutants that she could go to and actually live in peace. Oh, where could you find one of those? Apparently in Central Park. Anyways... You might have guessed, this is not a glowing review. I suggest that if you have not picked up this book, do not pick it up. Do not sell your hands on it when you go into your store. Save the $5. Save the $5 and add a little bit to it from somewhere else and buy yourself a Red Rooster. Or something else. i got a whole bunch of more really good uh, Indiegogo and Kickstarter campaigns coming up. Great stuff. Go buy something of worth. Something of value. Not this. Again, I really hope this artist, um, if those choices in the background were the artist choices, that's just wrong. But hopefully someone might give this person a good swift slap to the side of the head, tell them not to do that, because they're a good artist. But this storytelling is just horrendous. Save your money. Yes, I know, I went way too long on this, but and this was just a rant. But I had to rant on this, and especially, like, right away, to stop people from buying this book. Save your $5. Anyway, hopefully I'll have a more positive review of an older book sooner rather than later. And if I did save you $5, hit like, hit subscribe, Do me a favor and leave a comment. Tell me whether or not you like these kinds of videos. Because I don't know if I want to do them all the time, but it's good to intersperse them with other things that I'm doing. Just let me know if you actually want to listen to them. Sometimes the numbers don't actually add up when I'm looking at views. So it's good to hear from other people. Leave a comment. That's great. Love comments. All right. I'll see you later. Bye.